I'm not doing especially well on this particular round. Oh, by the way, welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, where we do not spend all our days playing solitaire. But if I were playing solitaire all day long, I would have real problems if, for instance, I were missing, I don't know, pick a card, any card. Uh, how about this one? The Jack of Hearts. If that were missing from the deck, there's no way I could win this game. Uh, I might not win it to begin with, but you just couldn't play it if there's one card missing. Today, we think a little bit about the unity of the church and how important every piece is. And if we start saying, well, we can only play with the black cards, then the game's already over. Or if we can only play with the red cards, you may as well not start. And if there's <clears throat> just one card missing, even that can be a problem. Every single card is important. Every single one matters. You wouldn't want to drive in a car if there were only one lug bolt missing from each tire. Or you wouldn't want to go up in a plane if, well, almost every single engine is working. It's important, each and every little bit. There are no unimportant parts and there are no unimportant people. For the kingdom of God is made up not only of the obvious, but it's made up of all of us and a bunch of people we don't even know. And thank goodness, thank goodness, that God knows all of us, each and every one, and does not play solitaire, but counts us in. So let's spend some time in worship, with God, and with one another. This is what Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, starting at verse 10. It's the section that comes right after his usual passage of greetings and hello and how are you and uh, so-and-so is here with me and I hear what's going on. Um, actually, the I hear what's going on part is what we're going to read. He says this, 1 Corinthians, first chapter, beginning at verse 10. Now, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, uh, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Uh, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ 
might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For what I want to say at the beginning of this sermon, I've, I've spoken from notes a couple times in this recording, and I've erased those because I've gone down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. So bear with me if for a minute I read what I was going to say, which is this. Think of this as the opening of a sermon being delivered. Well, this is the sort of rabbit hole I go down. I'll start. From time to time these days, somebody will ask me what's going on with the split that is expected to occur in the structure of the United Methodist Church whenever the general conference that was scheduled to meet in 2020 finally does take place. That will be, barring unseen delays, unforeseen delays, in 2024. I will give my stock answer, which is that things seem to be sorting themselves out with moves toward greater regional autonomy in what is, after all, a global organization. For the most part, the division seems to be happening along regional lines anyway. What concerns me most, though, is that along the way, we do not fall into bickering and nastiness. It saddens me to say that there has been some of that for a long time. It relieves me to say that in this particular region, 
by which I mean uh, southeastern Pennsylvania and eastern Pennsylvania in general. That bickering and that nastiness that we've seen take place occasionally and that it has really hit the online world in certain certain areas that I won't name. If you want, go Google them. You can find them. Uh, but here it has not predominated. And it may be a while before the fog of all of the things that are happening, all of our arguments and discussions and studies of, of human sexuality and of biblical authority, of, of church organization and of conflict resolution, all of those things that go together. When the fog of them all clears, and it will be a matter of years, we will be able to get back, back to work on what is our real business of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That assignment is what we should really be about. That assignment is what, what, what we're really all in agreement about doing. We just can't, we can't get over what have become, in many cases, distractions from it. I hope that helps. But I have to tell you that when a sermon text like the one we have today about the arguments in the church in Corinth comes up, I can't help but have my own situation, our own situation, at least partially in mind. And here's the other side. I cannot read the world without also having that Bible passage in mind. The Word of God is always, always the Word of God for us. So let me proceed. The alignment of Christians into different camps around one issue or another, or several issues all at once, is nothing new. It is very clear in the Bible itself. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was occasioned because they had begun to line up around different leaders. Chloe, Apollos, Euodia, Syntyche among them, and others were lining up in groups that were trying to name themselves by dragging out the big names. I belong to Paul, or I belong to Cephas, that's Peter, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Christ. Paul definitely did not appreciate having his name dragged into the fight that way. And I think he suggests that Christ would not either. He wrote back to the Corinthians. He said, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in my name, in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, uh, so that no one can say, you were baptized in my name. Now, Paul was not somebody who shrank from an argument. The book of Acts and his own letters detail his conflicts with James, with Peter, with Barnabas, with Mark, 
And that says nothing of his encounters with local officials that sometimes would leave him beaten up or locked up or both. In the end, though, what Paul argued for and what led him to some, though not all, of the scraps that he got into was his insistence that Jesus' gift of his life on the cross, Jesus' gift, and all that flows from it, was given for all people, for humankind in its entirety, Gentile or Jew. And, and those two groups were the big groups that the people he was writing to divided the world into. Sometimes they would say Greeks and barbarians, the others, or sometimes Romans and Greeks and barbarians. But from the viewpoint of the people in any synagogue in the Roman Empire and beyond, because there were some in other places too, the big division was between Jews and non-Jews, Gentiles, the nation. And Paul's point that he wanted to make was that when God sent Jesus as the Messiah, the one that the Jews had expected, the one of whom their prophets had spoken, the one to whom John the Baptist had pointed, he had done so so that God's grace would be there for everyone and not contained or limited. So Paul wrote to the Corinthians, or actually to the Romans, excuse me. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. And he will justify the circumcised on the grounds of faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. And that led, ironically enough, that being Paul's approach to evangelism, it led to divisions over inclusion at least from the Gentiles, the Gentile Christians' viewpoint. But from the viewpoint of the Christians who came out of a Jewish background, that was not the issue at all. Of course they welcomed Gentiles into the household of faith. That was not in question. Jesus himself had been, as an infant, greeted by Persian astrologers, the Magi. Jesus had preached among the Samaritans, and he had healed a Roman centurion's servant. One time when Jesus needed a break from everything that had been going on in his life, he traveled up into Lebanon, into the territory where he the Phoenicians, and there was a Syro-Phoenician, a Canaanite woman, a woman who had a daughter who needed help. And she went to Jesus, and Jesus said, you know, I wasn't sent to you people. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs under the table get the crumbs, don't they? And he said, yeah, you're right about that. Your daughter is healed. Even the Jewish Christians knew all of this and taught it. But for them, 
the love that Jesus had for everyone meant that, yes, everyone was welcome, but the question would be how they would respond to that love. What was the proper way to do it? To them, certain behaviors outlined in the Torah, in the Old Testament, the only scriptures that the early church knew, those delineated what was and what was not a life that would be pleasing to God. And nobody, not even the, the Gentile Christians, were going to be going around saying, ah, oh, it doesn't matter at all how you live. Those that said things like that, they found themselves being corrected by even people like Paul. You know, even to this day, we Christians might say, who cares if you eat a ham sandwich? But those Ten Commandments, you better take a good look at. We do make our judgments. And sometimes we know how to justify them. Sometimes we don't. But we do do that. Now, Paul was ready to give way on some things. But he was ready to give way as an expression of unity among believers, not as a requirement to be counted as one. He wrote, and this was again to the Romans, let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual edification. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have, have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. Give an example. It's probably not the worst thing in the world if somebody wants to have a glass of wine with their dinner. But if they are around someone whom they know has difficulty doing that, somebody who's got an addiction they need to guard against, don't do that. Don't do anything that might make somebody else stumble. Temperance. That's real temperance and what it means. Temper your thoughts and temper your actions to what helps and what builds up and what holds people together. What you want or like may be secondary. That was Paul. But not everybody was as accommodating. And there were people of genuine faith who saw him as somebody who was caving in to the prevailing culture. It was a setup for trouble that would last for the next century or two. And if it hadn't been him, it would have been somebody else who would have written about it. Because these arguments went on not just in one place, but wherever the church was busy establishing itself. But what he wrote might have been, as I say, a setup in the short run. But in the long run, 
it set up something amazing, which was that Christianity found a way and continues to seek ways of getting the gospel to people where they are, as they are, who they are, and letting the spirit take over. Now, I mentioned the Holy Spirit because this particular argument that I'm bringing up about the food and all of that, and even the inclusion of the Gentiles, that was not the primary argument in Corinth. There, it seems, if you read the rest of the letter, the big argument was about the gifts that the Holy Spirit was bringing to the community and, and how people were to react to that. Did it make somebody more spiritual? And if they were, did that mean they were better? All of that kind of stuff started going on. And the principle that Paul ended up drawing when he wrote to them about these divisions, whether it was over that or anything else, became something that could be applied on a wider scale. What he advised on the local level could be and would be, and I would say should be, applied on an overall level. And that principle is that we are one, one, in Christ. When we start chopping ourselves into smaller and smaller groups, we are one. And we're one in Christ. Because he's the one that, he's the one, he's, he's the person, he's the one who made us one to begin with and keeps us that way. He not only pardons our sins, he sets us in a community, a community with other believers, where we learn, we learn to work. And if it takes to struggle, to forgive one another, to understand one another, to bear with one another, to build each other up as brothers and sisters of the one who makes us children of God himself. Jesus' love sets us up to love one another as he first loved us. And that may mean, here, here comes the difficulty. That may mean that we care less about getting our own way. That we care a whole lot less about whether or not we win in any given situation. I mean, we follow a savior, don't we? Who won by losing, if you think about it in winning and losing terms. Somebody hanging on a cross in the terms of the world has not won. Somebody who is taken down from that cross, a broken, bruised corpse has not won in the world's terms. Someone who has to be buried in a borrowed grave, who has nothing left, not even the clothes that were on his back, 
has that person gone? But the crazy thing, the distinctive thing that we say is yes, he won. His love won through. And don't just look at that corpse. You'll be amazed what happens when God raises him up again. Like a referee lifting a victor's hand in the ring. We follow a savior who won us to God by losing his life. And the central thing that we have to tell the world, the central message that we have for it is that the world's priorities are so messed up, so completely out of line with God's view, of what true success and true winning and the true value of being human and of loving other people is. That once you get it from God's perspective, through Christ's eyes, then the world's definition of win and lose success and failure, those get flipped and overturned. To the world, the message of the cross is, well, it's foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness, said Paul, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So in that light, in that light, I'm willing to sound foolish when I talk about the church, even in the midst of these arguments and disagreements about it being one and about Christians having a fundamental and I'll say imperishable unity in Christ. Yes. It's there. And if you want to press it even further, we are divided by various points of theology and practice, by culture and language, by age and class, by gen, by everything we can put up there. And, and once we reach agreement on some of it, we'll find something else that'll split us apart. And the foolishness of it all is to say that the things we argue over and the things that we think divide us really do divide us. In fact, they can't. Not when we are held together by Christ. That's not to say we are never going to disagree on things. We are always going to disagree on things. And to be a little more frank than I intended to be originally here, um, we will continue sometimes to dislike one another. Personalities always get in the way. And I suspect they always will. But the question is whether we let the love of God overcome all of that whether the love of God will be the priority, whether the love of God for his entire creation embodied in Jesus gets put ahead of our judgments. The question is whether we will allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us, each taking up our own cross by his power.
and not our own. And following not our selves, but him. That is the hard work that comes after conversion. It's what we call, in Methodist terms, sanctification. And you know, even if the United Methodist Church splits apart, we still will have certain emphases. And one of those needs to be entire sanctification, letting our whole selves come under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not blocking out any part of our lives. And that's not easy. And it begins with how we react to and how we live with, sometimes ourselves, but definitely the people around us. Said Paul to the Corinthians, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. And if we are united, not in everything, but in the important things, in mind and in purpose. And I trust that by the Spirit we can well then, maybe in that light we would be able to see God at work in Paul and in Apollos, in Chloe and in Syntyche and in Euodia, in Barnabas, in James, in Timothy, in one another. And if we do that, we might learn and we might be able to say thank you to the one who made us all. Thank you that you, Lord, are you. And thank you that that guy I can't stand is him. Thank you that each and every person is that person and nobody else. Thank you that everyone who is beloved and belonging to Christ is beloved and is his. And thank you for the love that goes even beyond that and draws all together. Amen. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world and we know that we are part of that, both part of the sin and part of the rejoicing that the sin has been taken away. Grant that we might look upon one another with your eyes, that we might see one another as you see us. And as we move from worship into service, give us the grace to do so with joy, with laughter, with compassion, with understanding, and with hope.
Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>